Aloha kako. Welcome to Anahola Baptist Church with Pastor Kenny Elledge. We are searching the Holy Scriptures today, so get your Bible and ekomomai, join us. I wanted to speak this morning about marriage. Uh, I think the last time I spoke, I spoke about child rearing. And I wanted to speak today about marriage because the family is horrendously under attack in our culture, in the world really overall. They've been attack, under attack all through history, ever since God established the institutions of the family and of marriage. And there's been a war steadily waged against God's design for marriage and for the family. Social and political and even religious institutions have been increasingly relentless in attacking not only the institution of marriage, but have moved beyond that to attack the very fabric of what it means to be human. Across the board, society is becoming more and more confused as to what personhood is all about, not only in regard to the sanctity of marriage and the distinction of gender roles, but in regard to human sexuality itself, which has led up to confusion about what actually constitutes a marriage. The traditional categories that used to define sexuality, gender, and marriage have almost become culturally meaningless. Questions are raised that would formerly have been considered absurd if they were even considered at all. Doubts are planted, especially in the minds of our youth, and as they grow, the whole thing just becomes one big blurry picture. And it can indeed get very confusing, even for us as Bible-believing Christians, as we try to figure out how to, how to navigate through it all and how we should live in this culture, in this world. What should our response be to this confusion? What are we to do? Well, I really think that as Christians, although we need to be aware of what's happening in the culture around us, we also need to be careful about spending too much time debating whatever the issues happen to be, whatever issues happen to be blowing in the cultural wind. When appropriate, we should respond, but always with biblical truth. Our main focus must be a relentless return to biblical teaching about who we are, what God's purposes are, and how we should live. If we don't do this, if we don't follow this biblical truth, these issues, which are already a threat to our society, become a threat to the church itself. And I think we've seen that. Sadly, many churches and many Christians who identify themselves as evangelicals are becoming confused about these issues as the societal pressures increase. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what do I, what do we believe? Do we believe what God has said in His Word? Or do we seek to reconsider or change what He has said in His Word in order to accommodate the popular voices that we hear around us? We have to recognize that the Bible is either true or it's false. We don't have the option of picking and choosing what we're going to believe or what we're going to deny in the Bible. Augustine in the fourth century said it well, very simply, if you believe what you like in the Bible and you reject what you don't like, it's not the Bible you believe, it's yourself. So that's the basis that we're working from, taking the Bible as God's truth. Our goal is to understand it, to do business with it, or better yet, for it to do business with us. And we can't overemphasize the importance of what Paul says here in these few verses about the marriage relationship. And I want to point out that it's both 
deeply theological as well as deeply practical. So at this point, I want to present you with a very practical statement, and I'd like for you to consider whether it's true or not. I've said to each of my four and soon to be five married children that if both of you will daily submit yourselves to the Lordship of Christ, your marriage will be a success. Let me repeat that. If both of you will daily submit yourselves to the Lordship of Christ, your marriage will be a success. And I ask you, what do you think? Is that true? Is it true 100% of the time? Conversely, I've also said to them, but if either one of you or both do not submit to the Lordship of Christ, your marriage will be susceptible to failure. That's really in a nutshell what I want to talk about today as we go through this passage. And I intend to come back to those statements at the end of the, at the, end of the message. Now in this passage we have two parallel truths. First of all, Paul is clearly and directly making a theological connection between the marriage relationship and the relationship between Christ and his church. He clearly states that the marriage relationship is intended by God to reflect the mystery of Christ's intimate relationship with his bride, the church. And then secondly, he addresses the marriage relationship itself, and that's what our, our main focus is today. And I want to consider a few of the practical implications and applications of the specific commands and guidelines given. We have before us some pretty clear teaching on what marriage should look like and how it should function. How to do it God's way and not do it our own way. In regard to context, the previous section of chapter 5 in, in Ephesians, verse 11 says that we are to take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. How do we do this? We expose the works of darkness by our behavior, by how we live, by how we walk. In verses 15 and 16 he says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best, of, best use of the time, because the days are evil. Then in 521, Paul introduces this concept of submission, which provides both a, a transition and an introduction to the instructions that follow. This idea of submission in an age when personal autonomy is dominant, the, the idea of submission is really an odious term for many, many people. But he brings that, that word up, he brings up that concept here to make a transition into his instructions about marriage. And here in verse 21 he uses the one another language which indicates a mutuality of submission. Now as we come to, to this passage, to verse 22, we see a narrowing of the focus of the word submission. And as he does so, it naturally raises some questions. And you can see in your outline, number one, questions that arise from the reading of the passage. First, what does mutuality of submission really mean? Does mutuality of submission imply a, a bending or an erasing of role distinctions? And then, how is it that Paul exhorts the church in general, including husbands and wives, to submit to one another, verse 21, when he turns right around and seems to focus the submission exclusively on the wives? And then does the concept of submission imply that the submitting party or the submitting person is inferior to or less important or of less value than the person that they're submitting to? And lastly, how does the concept of headship fit into the concept of mutuality of submission. And headship is another word that often people, even Christians, bristle at in this day and age when they hear of headship. And I think it's because there's a real lack of understanding what biblical headship really is. So as we proceed, my aim is to shed some light on these questions and offer some clarity to this teaching that is very clearly and drastically countercultural. And that leads us to point number two on the outline, living counterculturally. 
And I bring up this idea of living counterculturally because, as we've already acknowledged, the content of this passage, especially those verses directed toward wives, is drastically and patently countercultural. We don't have to study the Word of God much to understand that as Christians we are called to live our lives in the Lord in a way that is countercultural. And that's because we live in a world of sinners. We live in a world that is in constant rebellion against God. Our world is dominated, practically speaking, by the evil one, and our culture takes its cues from him and from those who are in league with him. This is made clear in Ephesians a little bit later in verses 10 through 12, specifically verse 12. He says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And these evil spiritual forces are attacking and attacking and attacking marriage and the family and even what it means to be a human, a human being created in the image of God. As we all well know, the culture around us is constantly seeking to redefine marriage. But just because the social elites call all kinds of aberrations and perverse relationships marriage, that doesn't make it marriage. God is the one who declared what marriage is. Not long ago after the overturn of the Roe versus Wade decision by the Supreme Court, one of the Supreme Court justices postulated the idea that maybe they should go back and revisit the Ober, uh, Oberfell versus uh, Hodges decision which was the 2015 Supreme Court decision legalizing same-sex marriage. And in response to that, I heard former President Obama giving a speech. And in his characteristic, sarcastic, arrogant way, he said, <laughs> that ship has already sailed. That's exactly the way he said it. And I would say, yes, that ship has sailed, but it's a ship that is destined to sink. And if we read Romans 1, we know very clearly that that ship is going to sink. God is the one who not only established marriage, but he is also the one who has defined what marriage is. And he's the one who has determined what its significance and purpose is in the outworking of his sovereign design and plan. Now I hope that we can see the connection that this is, this is very, very important. I hope we can see the connection that if God's design for marriage is amorphous and changeable, that means that the gospel itself is changeable and thus irrelevant and our faith is worthless. Just as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that if the resurrection is not true, then our faith is worthless. Our faith is in vain. If God's design for marriage is changeable, the gospel is changeable. The theology in this passage regarding Christ and His church makes this crystal clear. An attack on the institution of marriage is not just an attack against a supposedly, uh, a supposedly outdated societal norm or tradition, but rather it's an attack on the gospel itself. Do we get that? Do we understand that? Do we see the connection there? Why is the enemy constantly attacking marriage and the family and the very definition of what a human being is it's because it's all related to the gospel an attack on those things is an attack on the gospel and we need to need to understand that okay so now let's look at some specific commands or imperatives that are given by Paul first to wives and then to husbands first we come to the instruction that is for wives, number three in your outline. Commands or imperatives directed to wives, verses 22 to 24 and 33. And here in these verses, there are two key words that Paul uses. Submit and respect. Verse 22a, wives, submit to your own husbands. Verse 24b, wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And verse 33b, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And I think it's very important that we acknowledge that some of the strong reactions from our culture against what these verses say are not entirely unjustified. 
In fact, one big reason, I don't think it's the main one, but a big one, that the reactions are so strong is because these verse, verses have been so horribly exploited and abused over the centuries. Yes, over the centuries, and even in the church. They've been used to subject women to horrible subservience, abuse, and mistreatment. Why is that? Is, there, is it because there's a gross oversight on God's part to put these verses in the Bible? Obviously not. They're exploited because the, the context, they're exploited because the context in the verses that follow are ominously ignored. Many men have loved to use selective hermeneutics, selective interpretation when they come to this passage. And in the process, they have completely twisted and convoluted God's word to serve their own selfish and sinful desires. Now, a caution I want to insert here. When we react against the abuses of these verses, we need to make sure that we're reacting against the abuses of God's word and not reacting against God's word itself. We can't just write off a passage of scripture and the commands that it contains simply because some have misused, abused, or ignored it. There are many who cite abuses committed by so-called self-proclaimed Christians to write off Christianity and the Bible as a whole. Some have even gone so far as to label Christians in the Bible as evil and the cause of all the world's problems. We've probably seen that recently, even in the news. It's not fair, but it's the reality. That's what people do. So returning to the text and examining it in its entire context, we clearly see that God's intention is to present a beautiful, harmonious balance to the marriage relationship. We see here in verse 22 that interestingly, interestingly, as Paul addresses the wives first, he relates this concept, concept of submission directly to the re woman's relationship with Christ. Verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. She is to submit to her husband as though he were in the place of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a remarkable statement. Now, what does the word submit mean here? Well, it means exactly that. It means to be subject. It means to line oneself up under. Used in a military sense of soldiers submitting to their superior, or in another sense, slaves submitting to their masters. The word contains primarily the idea of giving up one's own right or will. That is to subordinate oneself. And so I ask you, Wives, are you willing to line yourselves up under the authority of your husband as you should to Christ? And then Paul ups the ante even more as he goes on in verse 23 to say, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now Paul is drawing a parallel here. He says, even as. So if one is going to infer that it is oppressive and demeaning to say that the husband is the head of the wife, one must be consistent and say that it's oppressive and demeaning to for Christ's position as head of the church is oppressive and demeaning as well. Obviously, that would be blasphemy. But I make this point because we can't escape the parallel that Paul makes here. And Paul continues, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit, that's the same words used in verses 21 and 22, and everything to their husbands. There's another question. What does everything mean? It isn't qualified here, but I think we can rightly and logically qualify it by saying that it means everything that is not in opposition to God's word. Everything that's not a violation of his commands. Obviously, it does not mean that a wife should commit sin because her ungodly husband tells her to. God doesn't work that way. Now, here another very important issue arises. We need to acknowledge, and I'm, I'm sure we all realize that quite frequently in our marriages, we can make it very difficult for our spouse to obey these commands. Some husbands make it very, very difficult for their wives to joyfully submit to them and respect them when they treat them badly or when they live in an ungodly manner. 
Many men treat their wives horribly, whether it's physical abuse or verbal abuse or both. Many times it's just an extreme selfishness, a neglect, disconnectedness, treating them like they're unimportant, nothing more than a servant. How is the wife to joyfully continue to submit and to respect a self-consumed tyrant? Husbands, how do you treat your wives? Do you make it easy for them to submit to you and to respect you? And sometimes I believe, I believe this is a form of abuse as well, men make it difficult for their wives to respect and submit to them because they have abdicated the responsibility to lead. They've turned everything over to the wife to run the show, being lazy and putting the responsibilities that should be their own upon her. I think we all know that a lazy, detached person cannot be a leader in any context. And then we come to verse 25, and Paul spends the next nine verses in an effort to prevent these errors as he offers the husbands their list of commands. Number four in your outline, commands or imperatives directed to husbands. And here there are three key words used. For women, it was two words, submit and respect. Here there are three words, love, love, and love. Sounds like a Beatles song. Verse 25a, husbands, love your wives. 28a, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. 33a, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself. What does it mean for the husband to love his wife? How? How does he do that? He says in verse 25, husbands, love your wives. And that's the word agapao, which is the agape love. And the tense is the present active imperative. It's, it's an imperative. It's a command. And it indicates a continual, habitual action. How is a husband to love his wife? Continually, habitually, love your wives. As, or just as, in the same way as, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He did that for her benefit and for his glory. That's why... That's why and how Christ loved the church. That's why he gave himself up for her. So here's the theology behind the command. The husband is exhorted to love his wife in the same way that Christ has loved the church. Is there any better example than the self-sacrificial love of Christ? Can Paul be any more clear in what he means than to offer this example? Paul's language here directed toward the husbands clearly precludes any type of dictatorial tyranny. A dictator or a tyrant does not lay down his life for those under his control. Interestingly, Paul devotes nine verses here to the responsibility of husbands as compared to three verses that apply to the responsibility of wives. Now I want to insert here that just as we talked about how husbands can make it very difficult for their wives to submit to them and to respect them, Conversely, many wives can make it extremely difficult for their husbands to shower love on them and to treat them in a loving manner. For example, when the wife derides her husband and uh, insults him, criticizes him, refuses to submit to him, insisting on her own way or opinion, or when she mocks or dishonors him, especially in front of others, by arguing with him, etc., these things place a huge obstacle in the relationship that shouldn't be there. Now having said all of that, it's important to recognize that Paul doesn't anywhere insert a statement letting either party off the hook because the other person isn't upholding their end of the deal. He doesn't say to the wife, if your husband is loving you properly, or if your husband displays a sacrificial spirit toward you, you are to submit to him. Nor does he say to the husband, if your wife is submissive and respectful, you are to love her. Or your love is to be measured out to her according to the level of her submissiveness toward you. No, he just says to the wife, submit to your husband and respect him. And again, without qualification, other than to strengthen the command by relating it to one's submission to the Lord. And to the husband, he simply says, husbands, love your wives without qualification. Without qualification. 
other than to strengthen the command even more by using the example of Christ. Next we come to a couple of purpose statements. Why did Christ give himself up for her, for the church? So that he might sanctify her, verse 26, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Sanctify, the word agiazo, means make holy, consecrate, set apart for a special purpose. And I believe there's a direct implication to the marriage ceremony. Husband, when you married your wife, you set her apart as special and precious to you above all others. Thus you are to continually give yourself to her for that purpose, to see her grow and thrive in her spiritual walk and responsibilities. And note that he says, in the same way husbands should love their wives. That's present tense, which means or implies the continual existence of the obligation. Should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. In the same way means that the husband is to follow Christ's example. And not only that, but with the same purpose in mind. The same purpose in mind. Verses 26 and 27. In this way, the husband is really serving Christ to accomplish what his purposes are for the church. Christ's purpose is to sanctify our wives, men, to make them holy for his glory and for their good. And we serve in this sense as Christ's vicars to help sanctify our wives, to help them become more holy, more like Christ. Now I want to take a couple of minutes and talk about the one flesh concept that we see in verses 29 to 31. Verse 29, Paul continues, he says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it, and he cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. When he says nourishes, that's the idea of like nourishing children to, to maturity. And cherishing is to show affection, to show tender love. He says, therefore, a man shall leave, that is to leave behind his father and mother and hold fast or be glued, be glued to, be, jo be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The connection between the words flesh and own body, flesh, verse 29, own body, verse 28, is obvious. In marriage, the relationship between the husband and the wife becomes so intimate, it is as though they are physically one flesh. And this is represented in the sexual or the conjugal relationship as well. This is all the more reason that the husband should treat his wife with the same care or even greater care as his own body because she really is a part of him. And I want to put forth a couple of examples here from Scripture. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 to 6, Jesus uses the one flesh language from Genesis 2.24 is a prohibition against divorce in that the conjugal relationship is, it not only symbolizes, but also consummates in a physical way the two becoming one flesh. In Matthew 19, 3, the Pharisees came up to Jesus and they tested him by asking, is it lawful for, one, for one's wife? No, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And I'm sure we've heard th those words repeated many times in marriage ceremonies. And then in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 15 and 16, Paul indicates that the act of sexual intimacy is directly tied to the meaning of one flesh. He says, 1 Corinthians 6, 15, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. So, Contrary to what the, 
world says in the never-ending sexual revolution, so-called recreational sex was never a part of God's plan nor design. True, the true intimacy that God intended through the sexual relationship can only be expressed in the bonds of marriage. On a side note, just as we speak of the sanctity of life when we refer to the issue of abortion, we must also speak of the sanctity of marriage as it relates to the sexual relationship. And it's interesting how those two ideas are interrelated. Large majority, vast majority of abortions that are committed against babies are committed against babies who were conceived out of wedlock. One sin leads to another. One perversion leads to a whole host of perversions. Conclusions, number five in your outline. As we conclude, it doesn't take a great deal of discernment to understand that God's purpose for marriage is that husbands and wives complement and, and enable each other. And I know I focused a lot in this message on abuses, on disobedience. And I guess part of that is because there's so much of it in our culture, so much of it even in the church. But I want us to see Paul is pointing out the beauty of what marriage is and is and can and should be. He's pointing out the beauty of it. Husbands and wives complement and enable each other. And these commands given to both the husband and the wife are intended to work together in creating a beautiful atmosphere in which the marriage will thrive to God's glory. They're intended to facilitate, facilitate harmony and peace and security in the home in which the children will thrive as well. The Apostle Peter echoes the teaching of Paul as he writes to both husbands and wives, giving us a, a beautiful picture of God's intention for the marriage relationship. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 4, and then verse 7, he says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. So he's talking to wives who maybe have unbelieving husbands or even have, have husbands who may have professed faith but are not walking with the Lord, so that they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. Don't let that be the main thing, the, the main thing that defines you, ladies. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. You know, I can't treat my wife meanly or be in a, get into a, a fight with her and then go into my study and have an intimate prayer time with the Lord. It doesn't work. It's total hypocrisy. If you want to have an effective prayer life, men, treat your wife well. Love your wives. So returning to our text here in, in verse 32, again we clearly see the theological connection that Paul is making. And he states it plainly here. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And the word mystery in its New Testament usage refers to that which is incapable of being understood or discovered by human beings, but has been revealed by God. And here it has to do with the mystical union of Christ and His church. Once again, this is a reminder that God, God's established order has far-reaching implications. Everything that God has done, everything that is in His Word is interrelated. And then finally in verse 33, Paul returns to his main theme as he summarizes his instructions to both husband and wife. He says, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. There are two things that I, I want us to remember. First of all, the marriage covenant, and I want to emphasize the word covenant, really has theological implications and it's intended to illustrate and reflect 
the covenant that Christ has made with his church. Some years ago, my wife and I uh, sat down together and we, over a period of a couple, of three, a few weeks, we read through a book entitled This Momentary Marriage by John Piper and, and his wife, Noel. It's a wonderful book. I would highly recommend it. We read it together. We, I would re read a page out loud and she would read a page out loud and we would talk about it. And sometimes it brought up some pretty intense discussions conversation. And it was very, very fruitful. But here's a statement that they make in this book. When the impossible day comes that Christ breaks his vow, quote, I am with you always to the end of the age, unquote, then on that day a human being may break his marriage covenant. When is Christ going to break his covenant with his church? Never. So if we're in a marriage covenant, when is it okay for us to break that covenant? Well, if Christ breaks his covenant with the church, then we could do it, but that's not going to happen. That's how powerful this passage is, and that's why he uses the example of Christ in the church. In fact, the marriage covenant is supposed to reflect the primary thing here, really, in this passage is the love of Christ for his church and his covenant with his church. And marriage was made by God clear back in the beginning of creation, Genesis chapter 2, when he brought the woman to the man and he put the two were together and we came one flesh. That was intended by God to reflect the glory of Christ and his church and his purposes for his church. We have to understand that. We have to keep that in mind. Therefore, it is the covenant relationship that sustains and supports marital love and faithfulness. It's so important that we see this. Christ's love is what sustains the marriage relationship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who some of you already know that I like to quote often, he expresses this idea very well. He was engaged to be married, but he was never married because he was uh, executed by the Nazis. But he wrote some very profound things, even about marriage. He says this, As you gave the ring to one another and have now received it a second time from the hand of the pastor, so love comes from you, but marriage from above, from God. As high as God is above man, so high are the sanctity, the rights, and the promises of love. It is not your love that sustains the marriage, but from now on, the marriage that sustains your love. The more we understand and reverence the relationship between Christ and his church, the easier it will be to obey the marriage imperatives that are given here. And I have to say, and I think we all know that all of this requires grace, grace patience, and humility on, and love on both sides. Those of us who are married need to ask ourselves, am I making it easy or difficult for my wife or for my husband to obey these commands? Tim Keller in his book, The Meaning of Marriage, said, what makes a good marriage is when you come to grips with your sinfulness together and your selfishness, and you learn to repent and forgive and grow in grace together. In our marriages, if we truly understand grace we will be men and women of deep conviction and we will seek to obey Christ and submit to his lordship. It's those who don't understand or appreciate grace who become unbending, unforgiving, and self-seeking in their relationships and this is what leads to disorder and destruction. And similarly to, to quote Bonhoeffer again, he says, in a word, live together in the forgiveness of your sins. That is probably one of his statements that uh, has helped me more than anything in my relationship with my wife, as well as with other people, you know, people in the church. Live together in the forgiveness of your sins, for without it no human fellowship, least of all a marriage, can survive. Don't insist on your rights. Don't blame each other. Don't don't judge or condemn each other. Don't find fault with each other, but accept each other as you are 
and forgive each other every day from the bottom of your hearts. He wrote that while he was in prison. Such wise counsel. Are you humbly before the Lord seeking the deep spiritual wisdom that enables you to understand grace? Do we really understand grace? And I would assert that we must understand grace if we're to have a successful marriage. That's the key to it. So now I want to repeat the statement that I made at the beginning of the message. I can confidently say to anyone who is married or aspires to be married, if both of you will daily submit yourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, your marriage will be a success. It doesn't matter what your differences are as far as occupation or what you like, what you dislike, those types of things, what kind of food you like, none of that matters. If you're both submitted to the Lordship of Christ on a daily basis, your marriage will be a success. There's a couple sitting right here that just told me they're celebrating their 50th anniversary this week. And that's a wonderful thing. I told them that my wife and I celebrated 40 last year. We're all sinners and everyone who is truly saved is saved by grace. And God's desire for us is not that we be comfortable. And I probably, it wasn't my aim obviously to make anybody comfortable today. But his desire is that we be godly. His desire is that we be holy, that we be more like Christ. And examining these difficult issues is oftentimes cutting and painful. But as it burns away the chaff of sinful baggage and sinful behavior in our lives, we will begin to see it as a purifying and a healing balm to our souls and to our marriages and to our families. Let's pray. And then I believe Kenny's going to lead us in another song. Father, we thank you for your word.